silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. I'm speaking with Don today. How are you, my friend? Uh, very well. How are you doing, Well, I'm good. Well, let's just go ahead. Usually, I just have uh, people start off by talking about whenever you first incident started or you know what you're doing that day or, or whatever and I, I just leave it up to you uh yeah it uh i was uh i was probably in my early 20s this would have been 1978 will and i was living in uh oh an air uh city uh joliet illinois it's uh about half hour from chicago and uh can you hear me am i coming in clear yeah you sound good uh, and so I, uh, I used to go to the various state parks and go camping. I had friends that were into, uh, you know, I started out like a lot of people in the area. Uh, rurally, I did a lot of hunting, fishing, pheasant hunting, uh, even deer hunting in Wisconsin and, and went fishing a lot. And somehow it all morphed into fishing and camping with the guys I uh, went, hung out with in high school. And then when we, that changed as we got out of high school and we started just doing a lot more fishing and camping so uh my first uh encounter if you want to call it more of an experience is uh in uh sort of west central illinois and uh i had been uh morel hunting in may june of that year we have morel season usually early in the year in illinois and it's sort of like a combination of missouri and uh i want to say missouri and wisconsin climate the the hill forested hills where i live my area, that's the area that I went uh, uh, mushroom hunting, morale hunting, and we went out early, and uh, I uh, came across uh, what I want to call, at the time, I really didn't know how to describe it other than to say that initially I thought it was a buck deer uh, crashing through a thicket toward me and my dog as we were walking through uh, an area. I was looking for mushrooms, and uh, it sort of surprised me, and I sort of held back behind this huge tree not to... Uh, provoke it uh it was past deer season deer weren't even in rut this thing sort of holed up behind the tree stopped immediately uh we waited each other out for probably a good 35 to 45 seconds both standing there uh my dog did a 180 came back toward me after he sort of he, he gave it a muffled bark and i stood there and this thing finally and I figured it would be a deer, but uh, it shook the whole tree and actually knocked branches down to the ground when it crashed through this tree. And I all I didn't ever got a visual. All I got was a silhouette and this creature walking away. Uh, I'd say within a minute after I heard it, it was total silence for I'd say 45 seconds, and it just sort of turned. I could hear it turn and release branches and just sort of walk away, uh, just like another person, probably no bigger than me, maybe maybe a little bigger than me. It was. Uh, like a person was out there and I never did. I sort of stored that away in my memory banks and never talked about it to anybody again until, uh, 25, 30 years later when I got married. But, uh, did uh, it ever, did, it ever, married. did it ever acknowledge your presence in any way? Uh, other than when my dog, uh, actually, uh, went past the threshold of where it could have seen me. I was like 20 feet behind my dog. But my dog rushed ahead on a trail and I had a Siberian, uh, german shepherd mix and she uh always stayed ahead of me but she ran ahead and this creature like it was basically uh, crashing through the brush toward my dog and my dog just sort of let out a like a muffled bark looked back at me and then just sort of casually walked back to me as if to say let's go a different direction so then i just hold up for 45 seconds waiting for this thing to emerge which it never did Mm -hmm. And then after about, like I said, I, I, I know it was very close to a minute. I said, man, nobody's, I was afraid to make a move. It was like we were playing a waiting game. And finally, this thing just slowly turned. I saw the branches from this tree sort of spring back to where it was. Mm -hmm. And the thing steps, continue walking down toward this hill that, because uh, uh, where I was crossing was uh, 
a little game trail that went on this ridge uh, approaching this hill where this gigantic oak tree was. And a branch is damn near touching ground, and it sort of surprised me. I said, I, I don't remember a deer crashing through that thick of a ground cover. Uh, I've seen him do it. I've witnessed him going through weeds, but uh, and I'm surprised here, but this was not a deer. It was something, uh, I'd say, uh, it, it had definite footfalls, unlike a deer where you can sort of, uh, a deer can walk through leaf-covered ground and you can't hear him. Right. This thing, uh, I think, intentionally wanted to be heard. Uh, almost, and it was, uh, you know, that was my first encounter here in Illinois. Not, I'm not, I haven't touched into my, uh, I think in my email to you about my uh, New Mexico encounter, which was sure. a year later. Yeah, very interesting. I, it, obviously, it was aware of your presence. Yeah, and, uh, and it was sort of interesting in that area. This is 1978. I was uh, in this area of the West Central Illinois, and there's a lot of state parks around here, and I, uh, this was, I want to say, 15, 12, 15 years before I got married to my first wife, who I'm currently still married to. Uh, careful I word that. But, uh, <laughs> I, uh, but you're, she, you're uh, I, I, went out on a, I went out on a date with a girl that was local to the area, which was about a mile and a half from my, where I had my uh, experience in 79. This was in 78, and we were out there, and it pulled in this area by this, the uh, best way I could describe it is we have rivers and, in these canals or waterways through uh, probably three quarters of Illinois, but this one particular canal, this girl we pulled in, and I was pulling, turning around, and she goes, "Yeah, this is." Uh, she says, "Have you heard of the stories in this area of uh, we have like a wild man creature?" And I remember asking her, "So what is it called?" And she goes, "It's called Harry Larry." And I said, "Well, so then years later, BFRL shows up in this area, and I guess uh, I don't know. My niece told me they did a recording here, and I thought, well." BFRO has recorded uh, sighting spots probably going back 30 to 40 years just in my area, but nobody seems to resolve the fact that they're still ongoing. And I'm sort of the only guy sort of that I don't promote it, but I privately indulge in it because of my encounters in 78. So I go back to these local sites where I've had my personal encounters, nothing to do with BFRO, right. and I still see uh, evidence of activity, I guess you'd call it. It's pretty interesting. There was already a, a local kind of a history of activity there. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, uh, I didn't know until I checked the BFRO database, and I'm like, they are basically have a chapter in every state. Mm -hmm. But the guy that's in charge of the Illinois chapter, uh, and you probably know him, he's uh, uh, Stan Courtney. He's been around uh, the two or three tri-state Midwest area doing all these uh his own uh, audio. Well, I, I captured my own audio, I'd say, comparable to what uh, Stan Courtney did. And, of course, I don't have thousands of recordings, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I still have, uh, I guess you'd call it audio voc vocalizations. Yeah. And they're, uh, they're interesting. And uh, it's sort of uh, what spawned it is my encounter in 78 and then eventually in 79 in New Mexico, which is my next event I'll, I'll touch into whenever, okay, sure. whenever you're ready. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's that, up to you. that was. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, unless you have any questions, well, uh, to flesh it out a little better, but. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I uh, I was uh, I had moved from uh, '78. I was uh, in my early 20s. I, I want to say I was 22, 23 uh, uh, when I had my uh, encounter in '78, 24. Excuse me, and uh, I moved down to New Mexico because I could. I procured a job working as a. Uh, basically a plumber, and uh, and ended up uh, having my weekends off. And that allowed me to uh, explore the area, I continued my camping tradition I had in Illinois, camping and fishing. They had a lot of trout streams in the area of uh, this area. Uh, it's no surprise to anybody, but it's a, sort of a green belt. Uh, it's west of Las Cruces, and it's in an area called the Black Range, uh, Gila National Wilderness Area. And that's where I uh, I worked in in that vicinity, and I would go camping uh, in the area on a weekend. While I uh, I decided to go down there uh, in uh, the Black Range Mountains uh, in the southwest corner of New Mexico, and uh, and uh, camp in the uh, basically the Black Range Mountains, and uh, accomplished that with basically a backpack and my camping dog at that time was uh, Samoy. Uh, I no longer had the German Shepherd from uh, Illinois, 
and we went up into the down from the mountains, uh, probably good uh, as a crow flies seven miles down the mountain, but it was probably closer to I want to say uh, eleven, maybe eleven and a half, twelve miles because uh, I had you have to walk the ridge line in these mountains. You can't go straight down them; I mean, they're at a sixty-five degree grade, and uh, and I went camping there uh, by myself with my dog in the base of one of these mountains uh, uh, on a weekend. And I ended up encountering uh, uh, encountering, uh, I guess you'd call it, uh, a lot of noises and things I was unprepared for that evening. Mm-hmm. Uh, starting at about uh, nine thirty, uh, probably higher in altitude. You're above the mountains. I had parked in an area where these roads basically. Uh, uh, switch back, go through the top of the mountains, and I actually parked in a section, which is par- probably part of the U.S. Forestry Service. So uh, it's a road for observation, but you can also you can camp. Uh, it's not so co- controlled nowadays. You probably couldn't get back there, or you, you could if you limited, though. But I went down uh, that 12-mile uh, from where I was uh, parked into Mountain Valley and set up camp down there, and... Uh, and found a fishing hole and had my uh, fishing um, backpack, uh, my fishing gear in my backpack, and and I found these little isolated trout streams in these, like, mountain gorges where they're basically these cold pools that are 10 to 12 feet deep, sort of waterlocked in between these mountain gorges. And uh, got lost uh, the first day back there, and it took me an additional three to four hours to correct where I had hiked out of and find the the uh, creek that followed it back to my camp, and I, I was probably got back around six thirty seven o'clock, and uh, it didn't get dark until 9.30 that p.m., and that's uh, shortly thereafter darkness. 9.30 is when all the, uh, what I call strange, mm-hmm. uh, un- unfamiliar activity that uh, now at 27, 28, I was... Uh, I've been camping since I was 15, 14 years old. You know, our family come from a tradition of hunters and and fishermen, but mostly hunters because of, uh, I guess you'd call it, the military aspect. My dad was in the Air Force. Uh, We all, my my sister used to go hunting with me. She had her own shotgun. So we were sort of coming from a, I won't say a gun-based culture, but definitely it was, uh, you know, we lived in Illinois, but we might as well have lived in Canada. Sure. So uh, that's that was my uh, my episode that uh, I, I I had my back back hung up in a tree when this happened at nine thirty. My uh, unfortunately my uh, handgun was in my backpack and all I had was a, a sheath knife in uh, a small campfire. My dog and uh, and his fear to go out against whatever this thing was circling my camp till four thirty that morning. Good. Uh, that was probably I, yeah. This went on. I'd say now at 64, I'm a retired electrician. I, I would put that up there with the top probably one out of 10 items. That would be the top item. I would still be terrified. Uh, it's almost like my hair. I could still feel it. Here it is 30-something years later. I could still feel my hair sort of stand up on my arms from this encounter. And it was basically this creature circled me. And I come to the conclusion there was probably more than one because... It boldly walked across the creek bed mm-hmm. within 65, 70 feet from where my base camp was and just boldly walked into my camp under nightfall with a uh, non-existent moon because the mountains were so high. The moon was up there. It was behind the mountain peaks, mm-hmm. and it was dark as I could put my hand in front of my face, and I probably couldn't see it without the gradual light from my campfire. And, and this thing, uh, like I said, it changed position. This went on, it was like a marathon of terror from 9.30 p.m. to 4.30. And I remember when I got back, and I worked weekends for a rancher, and he told me, he says, so always take a person with you, if not, at least take your dog. And I says, I think next time I said, I told him my dog was enough. Right. That the dog was more of a, it was a a nice alarm to have with me. Mm -hmm. But uh, having that gun up there, I don't really think the gun mattered because I had a, uh, a sheath knife, a buck. 110 buck, which is, you know, I thought, well, it's there were black bears up there, but generally black bears don't circle at night. There was no huffing or puffing. It was more of a something that sounded like it was wheezing, like it had uh, just really a large lungs. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, it, it, I was petrified, and still at my age, I was glad that I had the ability to possibly run. But apparently, my dog would probably uh, not engage this thing. It was on my, ch- I had it on a choke chain in my camp, and the choke chain was relaxed most of the time because he wasn't like straining to get out to this creature. Right. Uh, and, and what triggered it off was what gentleman is walking a good 12 mile walk on and off game trail from the parking lot down an altitude of over 7,000, 7,400 feet to my base camp after sunset and risk not just the mechanical injury, but actually walk into my camp. I actually whistled out to it, but I never once said, who goes there, Mm -hmm. please identify. I was getting that close, but I thought, whoever this thing was, when it walked across the creek, it was like, here I am, and it just walked across the creek. And then when it was on the cliff across the creek, just viewing me when it first walked in, and I I heard, it was like I could hear the riprap, or rap, uh, sandstone rock on the top of the cliff face uh, being walked on. You could hear the crunching, and I was thinking, wow, this sounds like a bear or something. You know, like coyotes are silent in that kind of level that you can't hear them. Right. And the same goes for crew. This thing wanted to let me know, hey, I'm here. And guess what? And then I'd say not even eight, five, eight minutes later, that creek 60 feet away from me where my campfire was built, and I was sitting there with my dog, something just starts to walk toward me. And I just had a few scrub oaks, uh, junipers, and uh, and snake cactus and some saguaya, uh, some small... Uh, uh, century plants, as they call it. So th- this area in New Mexico is very similar to Southern California, where I was at. It's got that kind of, mm-hmm. you know, feel. But it was uh, unfortunately uh, 4:30 when it started. Uh, it was starting to get a little lighter out. This thing, uh, it sort of fell back, and when it left, it, I didn't hear it at all. It sort of like snuck off. Yeah, and, and you said I you believe heard some vocals. Uh, I heard heavy, uh, like, breathing. It was like, at first I thought, oh, it's got to be a bear, because that's where your mind goes. You want to say, right. oh, it's got to be a black bear. And the only thing else is there were pole herefords and cattle in the area. Really, but I said, there's no way Paul Hereford got down into this canyon, uh, Gorge Valley from 7,000. Yeah, they're usually up crossing the road. So I was like, this is a big animal. And I thought, immediately I thought it's a person. And I thought it was a big park ranger walking in with his gun, and I was waiting for him to say, hello, this is, you know, what are you doing down here? I followed your trail in the middle of the night, which, first of all, would have been, you know, unlikely, because I think they do, uh, there was no rescue for me. Uh, and you no probably would have seen time. a flashlight, too, right? I was seeing a flashlight. I would have heard voices. I heard none of that. I just heard the bipedal footsteps of something that was, at one, several points uh, where it was approaching me, was didn't care. It just like walked in, like here I am. You can hear me walking, and then when it would like change position, it's where I think the second individual was involved. It would like be in front of me on my north, and then immediately I'd hear a noise to myself on the other side of my campground. And I'm yeah. thinking, I'm probably surrounded. There's two, could even be a third, but that wasn't until months later when I, I, I sort of kicked myself for not looking for footprints. But uh, mm-hmm. now I, I sort of. Uh, I have that situational awareness I didn't have then. So that, that that's part of the, the nuts and bolts of my encounter. Uh, my dog was emitting a deep-throated growl, just loud enough for me to hear as if to say, just stay there and uh, I'll stay here. My dog was like no indication he wanted to go after it. And it was a male Samoy, which they look like uh, white, white Siberian Husky, basically, without the markings. Yeah, it, it sounds like he was well aware of what was out there and, and uh, not too willing to go beyond where he was. Yeah, uh, well, I, I sort of, as the night wore on, I started worrying out of firewood, and I couldn't go out at like, you know, 2, 3 o'clock and gather more with this thing circling my camp. And uh, I'm sure my dog probably would have disappeared and I would have never seen him again, but the other thing was is uh, I didn't have that night vision like I do now, then uh, 17... Nine, uh, sure, there was military grade night vision, but uh, you'd have to go to an army surplus to buy it. Not very good and, back in uh, those days. <laughs> no, no, they were probably first generation or. I and the thing is, is I I had binoculars that were starlight vision, but you had to have really starlight and moon, and uh, 
Right. I was in this valley gorge uh, in the Black Range, uh, just east of uh, uh, what I would refer to as Sillsboro, and then there's another uh, small town called Black Range Station. And you go up in the Gila National Wilderness, and this is quite a distance before you get to the uh, Gila Cliff Dwellings. But I, I went to that area. It's called. Uh, it's well known to this day. They put. They took the signage down, but there was a sign marking that area called the Neely Nun Monument. And I can't. I camped. Uh, uh, I I actually found out where that marker was, and I I deployed myself and walked down the mountain to uh to camp on the approach in Ely Nun, and I never uh, decided to stay the second day to uh to walk out and take pictures of it because it's sort of a a rock uh artifact uh due to erosion that looks like an actual person or woman kneeling down so they call it the Neely Nun monument and it's uh it's in that part of southwestern New Mexico so I, I was I was in my camping days and I had a lot of strangely enough uh here I am 64 I had a lot of Native American friends and and uh, Latinos that uh, I went camping with back then that knew the area better than me and Mm -hmm. uh, told some wild stories, uh, but uh, I don't know. I I think I encountered whatever the heck they were talking about back then. How did they talk about it? I mean... Well, they made references. uh, On the weekends, I'd get together with some of my Native American Navajo friends when I lived in New Mexico, and I had a few Latino friends, the Theas brothers, and we'd hang out, and they'd talk about... uh, Hey, uh, shouldn't be walking. We'd be out drinking beer at a point near, uh, basically U.S. forest area, uh, on these small foothills. And they go, yeah, you don't want to be walking around here at night. And they made references, not just to Bigfoot. They were talking about little people. Sure. And the little people were, uh, they had names for them, all the various tribes. But, uh, this reminded me of an account I had, uh, in Illinois when I was, uh, of course, that's another show, but it was probably, I was seven, eight years old, uh, and uh, it was an area I lived near in Chicago, which was, uh, there was uh, tribal influence in an area where I lived, and they did, uh, they had a history of little people, and, uh, you know, so I, me and my sister saw, well, for the, probably, best explanation would be a, a 15-inch to 18-inch tall being with clothes, mm-hmm. walking around our house until that house, everybody moved out of it. So I don't know if it was haunted. All I know is I don't know paranormal, and I certainly don't uh, engage in that with, in the Bigfoot world. I look at it. It's a, right. That's something different. I yeah. guess different topics. <laughs> yeah, it's a different topic. And I, I know with you, uh, I followed your research and work, and I've uh, I've read about, uh, you know, when I was uh, in the 70s and in sixties about Ivan T. Sanderson. I wrote read his book and uh a lot of other uh books by uh early researchers mm-hmm. and not really uh totally convinced but it was always a question on my mind. They were you know, Ivan T. Sanderson and Grover Kranz were talking about these creatures and I always sort of thought, Yeah, it just reminds me of uh that one film, the Patterson Gimlin film, but I never went any deeper than that. Yeah. Did you have any experience so after been... Oh, go right ahead. Go right ahead. Go ahead, Will. I, I'm listening. I, I was just going to ask you what what you if you had experiences after the New Mexico night there. I uh, yeah, after uh, the New Mexico, and I got a hold of my rancher and told them I didn't touch on that. I I, I told them it was, uh, you know, I said I had a, heard a lot of creatures that night, and it was the following weekend. I was working for the rancher in New Mexico, and he goes, "Yeah, I told you my stories about uh, being scared out of the woods with his family. It, the woods got real quiet. And he he acted like there were some creatures coming into the woods and him and his wife and their kids left. And then he told me uh, he spotted a creature sitting in a rock canyon near Cliff, New Mexico, sort of swaying back and forth as he drove by on his truck. So he told me, he says, never go camping alone. So this guy was like sort of recounting his experience with Bigfoot. And I always thought, oh, that's just, that's up there in Oregon or Canada. It's not down here. That was my sort of uh, conclusion, which you hear hundreds of eyewitnesses, you yourself interview, attest to that. Right, right. Actually, there's quite a bit in New Mexico. Yeah, and I didn't know the activity. And then, then of course, my Native American friends made matters worse by telling me, hey, maybe you had a skinwalker experience. And that was a whole new area, you know, and I was like, what are those? And uh, and so then uh, when I moved back to Illinois, I... uh, 
I continued my tradition of camping, fish camping. I would I went out with a recent friend of mine. He was part Native American from this area, from Peoria, and uh, he was always interested in the topic. But uh, I never talked to him because of the ridicule of my uh, Sasquatch experience until probably a year or two before he died, and that was uh, so for thirty plus years. I was sort of my secret that only maybe my wife knew and. Eventually, I told my son, and so uh, as a result, I thought, you know, I'm not out, out here to convince anybody, so I basically started uh, my own YouTube channel, and I, I go out on my own investigations, and I film evidence, but uh, it's probably the result of uh, listening to Rover Kranz, reading Ivan T. Sanderson material, uh, uh, your, your stuff out in the field I was well familiar with long before you were uh, in Chronicles, but... Uh, I thought I wanted to say that name. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't say it either anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so yeah, that was. So I did have. Uh, I returned in Illinois uh, back in uh, '81. Got married, and then of course in the '90s into probably as of recently, I've had. Just because of my YouTube channel, I've been having filming footprints timestamps for audibles i'm getting a lot of vocalizations that i'll pick up later mm-hmm. in my uh if i'm using a good enough uh audio tape recorder i can usually pick those up but i have my own channel and it was just sort of opened the door for me to say you know i'm not here to convince anybody but i'm going to apply the scientific method to go out in the field do my own research and to date i've been doing that for a couple of years and i've dragged three members of my family into it and uh it's sort of like a private joke they don't ridicule dad, but they sort of know that, you know, they ask that question, I'm not going to lie to them. Sure. Have they experienced anything yet? Uh, my son has sort of uh, been with me when we've experienced uh, knocks, but he explains it away as something else. And there was another encounter. I went to a state park just 2015, and it was not far from a, a BFRO sighting, probably within a three-quarters of a mile. And I'm leaving this park, the only one there, including the park employees, the state park. And it's, uh, I want to say, February going into March. And it was just starting to uh, warm up to 30 degrees outside. It's still cold. And I hear uh, one, one knock answered by two knocks as I was leaving. And it has two small parking lots, and there was nobody else in this parking, the state park, uh, and the employee's parking lot was empty, and I'm thinking it's on a major river. All the green belts are on the major rivers where I have my sound recordings that I've picked up, vocalizations. I've heard uh, basically what I call, I don't know if I want to even call it gifting. I have, It's like I'll be taking my back trail out from an area I've walked four or five miles into, and as I'm leaving, I'll encounter a uh, little... Uh, like an empty turtle shell. Another day it was uh, a chicken, uh, it was a deer foreleg that had been part, part of the meat had been eaten off, but most of the meat was on there and it acted like it was just laid on my uh, my exit trail. Uh, there was no other way to exit, so, and I just walked through that area an hour earlier. So I, I get that kind of activity, uh, vocalizations, uh, you know, and I always try to explain it away with, uh, I guess the scientific method is knowns and material knowns that you know are out there. Uh, Well, in Illinois, it's limited. We don't have black bear. The occasional, maybe a lot of coyotes, and that's another thing I notice. A lot of coyotes get triggered by uh, these vocalizations, and I've been in three different locations in the last year in the state of Illinois where I've encountered this... uh, it's like a provocation call to piss off the coyotes or mm-hmm. something will just call out. And uh, it sounded like uh, a wolf in areas that we don't have any wolves. Sure. Uh, but uh, that, that my son witnessed. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, I don't go out looking for tree structures in my, no, my own personal research. Uh, mm-hmm. As a result of my own encounters, I look for, uh, when I was in New Mexico, I saw no evidence of tree structures yet. Uh, I wasn't looking for it, so I don't know how that pertains to my uh, early encounters, I guess. But uh, that that's sort of the sum of uh, 
you know, it's sure changed my life. Uh, I try not to let it be a obsession or a passion. It's more of a, it's a hobby that I learn, I guess, I get knowledge from, but at the same time, I'm no, I'm no more of an expert than anybody else in the field. And as a result, uh, I sort of figure it's a collaboration between guys like you and the, uh, Right. People that maybe have been doing this for forty years, because I don't like to say expert. It's just my my pet yeah, peeve, I, I guess. I, I don't think anybody's an expert personally. That that's my my opinion, and uh, but it's good, you know, that you're not making an obsession. I've seen it wreck people's lives over the years, and uh, you know, you, you have to have a real balance with it and uh, and patience. Yeah, I mean, knowing the immensity. You know, having my own grandson and going, you know, let's go to a state park, uh, and I don't want to leave him unattended. And you know, you're like, you know, right. you communicated in a way to the family, Larry. You're just saying, I like, show concern. But knowing what I know, I I know these creatures have the ability to uh, disappear people. And in my area, where I, I, I look at human contact or civilization is closer on the fringe. So you see these creatures within yards of state national park trails where you know there's no boy scout activity and and i'm sort of like utah sasquatch in that field i i was cub scout and explorer scout you know and i also was uh you know i was basically uh in charge of a troop uh, in my local town and my son was a member so I, i took kids camping and you were like you knew that uh the danger that was there then, if I would have known it then, I probably wouldn't have just said, you know, hey, yeah, just go camping through a, uh, you know, go daytime hiking through an unmarked area and don't worry about, you know, uh, surveilling it or taking adults with you. We used to do things like that, thinking kids were safe, and I'm thinking, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, you can, uh, I look at it as an unknown primate living on the fringes of, our small towns, rural towns within areas where they have access to, uh, I think there's an interaction going on. I see accumulated uh, places where, like, garbage uh, bottles and cans are sort of like, uh, I'll walk for miles and see nothing, and it'd be mm-hmm. pretty barren. And all of a sudden you'll see just, like, an area where, like, cans or things were accumulated, and you sort of, what homeless person would walk five or six miles into a desolate area and then just live live there you know it's not right it don't make a lot of sense i'm getting yeah that's not the profile i'm getting because i'm getting the associated snaps or breaks which are traditional but i'm getting the footprints Mm -hmm. and uh, i have that in my uh my video on uh my youtube channel if uh anybody cares to hear it but it's uh it's still my sasquatch uh at youtube sure i'll um i'll put your the link to your youtube page uh with the video or with the audio here yeah i have yeah, you could, uh, yeah, I'd appreciate that. Uh, and like I said, I can send you those uh, timestamp links of my vocalizations on, I think, a video I did three or four weeks ago, which uh, uh, yeah, actually, if you'd I, like... I go into an area that's it's similar to, like I said, it's a Wisconsin-Missouri-type area in north, west central Illinois, and mm-hmm. it's sort of not, it's not indicative of what you would think of Illinois. You would think you were in Missouri. It's not really, people are unaware of it. Yeah, if you've got any of the audio you'd like to go along with this interview, I'll I'll link them right in with the uh, after after we're finished. I'll put them at the end, folks, and uh, you can listen to Don's recordings. Yeah, uh, I can. Uh, yeah, I'll I can either email them to you or uh, yeah. send them or whatever's appropriate. Sure, just send them send them to my email, William Jevening at yahoo dot com, and and, okay. I'll, and I'll link them right to this. Uh, and, so people get a chance to hear what uh, you're talking about. Yeah, see, I'm sort of like, uh, you know, I'm your age, but I'm not a new generation researcher. I've just sort of come in at the heels of, you know, you got guys like uh, Colorado and Sasquatch and all the guys, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that have been doing this for a long time. And I've been doing it sort of, uh, it was like my silent uh, investigation of truth, I guess you'd call it, because I didn't really, I don't even go public on my own videos. I don't show my face. I'm more... I, I want to be more of the anthropologist in the fact that I'm not interacting. The feed's not about me. Uh, right. I've had guys in the Bigfoot community later on say, you know, if you can keep your face off of it for like six months or longer, you may not invite a lot of uh, trolling and all the just kooks negative, out there. Uh, all the kooks, yeah. yeah. And so I've, I haven't, you know, 
Uh, I'm just gone so far. I haven't, uh, you know, even my videos, I don't have the last name. I just say it's it's me, and I'm associated with this channel, and I'm sure people understand. And, and I'm kind of the same way, even. I mean, the only reason I came out in the public was after publishing my first book, you know, basically to get it attention. Um, because, you know, I mean, you, you, don't, you don't write a book for it not to get attention, so. <laughs> but I don't show. Oh, yeah, I yeah. I, I mean, and show. I... Uh, I yeah. I appreciate the endorsement because uh, uh, I look at the people that were the forerunners, not just you and uh, John Green and Renee DeHinden, but I look at the people that were the forerunners of finding Bigfoot, which to me isn't, you know, as they refer to not finding Bigfoot. But, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> that, uh, but uh, I, I'm more in the camp of uh, people like uh, 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 basically uh, Autumn's, Autumn Williams, who basically took a lot of heat long before, back when I was thinking about, should I go for a hike by myself and take a camera, and do I want to risk not going out, going out in the same type of right. environment without a gun? Yeah, it's how, you know, how and much she is doing hassle. it with a camera crew. Yeah, she was doing it with a camera crew, but I mean, I still think they were more stealthy than how they have a team of 10 people going in now and a sound guy, and I'm just thinking, I go out by myself, Will, and I, uh, I saw fun my YouTube channel. I'm not, a, I'm not into the Patreon yet yeah, because I don't want my subscribers to feel they're indebted to me that my lifestyle sure. is more important than theirs. And, and I think, uh, I think it's know. more important to you know work at getting to the bottom of what's going on. It's like I, I don't share a lot of the stuff that I have just for the fact that I'm not, it's not all about attention. It's about getting to the bottom of what's really going on out there. Right. It probably copyright would probably be second most important after that. But I'm just kidding. Of right. There's a lot of people but, uh, like you that I, I but, don't mind sharing information with and, and stuff that I have. Uh, you know, and some some stuff I'll put in books, but it, it is more about really you know getting to the bottom of what's with this subject instead of all of the uh, the junk that goes on out there. Yeah, and so I mean I have to put it in the light of moderation. Uh, exactly. I figure if you have a show once a week, if I can think of it more than twice a week, I'm I'm not uh, overtaking my family obligations and letting it get in the way of my, you know, my own daily responsibilities. So I, I, I have to sort of attribute it to an area of serious interest, sort of like astronomy or, you know, you know, but I believe in the scientific method because that's the only thing we have right now. And even Absolutely. that is uh, the question comes in, a question was raised the other day about, well, you know, it's not what Bigfoot are, it's what more are they. And I'm thinking, well, that science might in the future answer that, but right now science can't uh, mm -hmm. can't read a crystal ball. Science can only give you evidential hardcore, you know, and that's why I think uh, when they say the genome and the genetic makeup and DNA can be known by science, but they still will not have approve it and, and recognize it as a phylum or a kingdom, then you're actually waiting for science to give it approval. And, and I always personally accepted that uh, there's unknowns out there. Uh, and, you know, and I'm not just talking about Bigfoot. I guess uh, once you get into type fives and sixes, you're, you're, you're entering whole new areas. And I, I'm just dealing with what I know right now. Exactly. And I think the, I think people, a lot of people jump the gun, you know, they, they want to look at things down the road when the first step is to basically prove that they're real, and then science will take it beyond that and, and take care of all those other issues. Yeah, I mean, I'm not against uh, repetition, or I guess you'd say uh, it's not so much repetition, it's just getting the valued evidence right. so you have the burden of proof, because I know your, your JRG groups, they accumulate you know, castings and photographs and video and audios, and I have a guy that does this in Illinois, and I'm thinking I, I, I can go to his data bank of thousands of audios, uh, uh, Stan Courtney from BFRO, mm -hmm. and he's more of, uh, I would say, even on the fringe of BFRO, I, I don't think he really, you know, polishes his membership badge, but uh, sure. <laughs> uh, but I think he he, uh, he definitely gives it, uh, I, have, I have a base or archive to compare my, vocalizations with and it's time consuming and I don't like the uh, I guess you'd call it the uh, the laptop work I'll do it it's just to me it's a it, it's just a bunch of frivol you know you got to do it you got to go through all every inch of uh, video and I uh, try to keep my videos to 30 minutes now because 
you know, scrubbing through an hour of video to find a... It's a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, I find audios, uh, vocalizations better than I do the supposed silhouette or shadow splotches. And mm -hmm. I think I'm, I'm past that to me, the definitive truth. It'd probably be HD video, but I look at so much of that we've already have, and they're still debunking it, or I don't right. like to use the word debunk, but they're, they're not using skept true skepticism as a science to debunk it, so it's, to me it's not relevant. Right, there's a lot of people that are actually, they're trying to debunk rather than be skeptics. Yeah, and to me, the skeptics, uh, you have to have come up with proof to the contrary, which is true right. skepticism, which is, you know, the science of actually using the high I, I love skeptics. method to disprove it. I love skeptics. I, love I, skeptics. I, I, think I, I don't like debunkers. Right, I'm the same way. I love skeptics because they have the great they have the great questions and they make us work harder for the right answers. Yeah, and that's why I did this for myself, Will. I I thought uh, why I don't you know despite what Grover Krantz did in his excerpts, uh, his book, mm -hmm. and and even Ivan T. Sanderson and uh, uh, he wrote a book uh, I believe it was called The Abominable Snowman or right. something to that effect. I, I read that back in the '60s and then. Uh, saw uh, Legend of Boggy Creek uh, mm -hmm. sometime before, I think, the, Gim the Gimlin-Patterson film came out. But uh, I, I was of the opinion, I said, you know, nobody is like stepping forward. We don't have, back then, we didn't have the Jeff Meldrums or the Melva Ketchums to step forward and say, we're going to take all the flack. Mm -hmm. So the collaborative e effort wasn't there. Now there is. So I I've come out of the closet, so to speak, as it's not like a, a private hobby. So I, when I launched my YouTube channel, I've already got 20 videos, and mm -hmm. I don't want, uh, I guess you'd say, the relevance or the importance to be me, on me as a soul, as a person. Sure. I'm just the voice behind the camera saying, hey, look at this and that. And, right. Uh, and and, and it's, hard, it's hard to keep it honest and uh, have integrity because I think, the Bigfoot community is is toxic in of itself. Oh, I think absolutely. You've had conversation. It is. So, yeah, it is. And I've seen you. You know, you've had a deal with the onslaught of that. So I, I don't. I'm just like it's murky waters. I'm going in slow. I'm not going to really. You know, I don't have t-shirts or products. I, I think that's a smart like approach. Like you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if I I look at it, if I want a t-shirt, I'll wear yours in the field. But. Uh, uh, but I don't, uh, like I said, I got a few people in my family that go on a, out with me on my excursions, and they don't want to, uh, whether it's their job or career, they don't want to have the ridicule factor right. uh, visit them because they're being held accountable because I filmed them in one of my videos, so I have to be careful. Well, listen, Don, we're running a little short on time, so okay. I okay. Certainly, certainly appreciate the interview and your time. Very interesting stuff. Yeah, in uh, uh, like I got uh, my channel is Illinois Sasquatch. Uh, I just call myself John, and uh, I, I'm just starting out. I don't want to. Uh, I'm just portraying the area and environment here that's uh, contrast to what you might see out west. And contrary to belief, there's not a lot of tree structures per se. It's not exactly. This I, isn't. I agree uh, it, it, it's not Colorado. It has different sign. And the sign is, it's like these creatures adjust to the environment, so you don't have stands of aspens and pine trees. This is in Colorado. So people seem to understand it's sort of a Missouri slash Wisconsin type mixture, and that's in of itself a very strange uh, environment to, to see these creatures uh, interact with the environment, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, very interesting. And thank you again, Don. And, uh, well, I, I'm glad you uh, had a chance to. I uh, had a chance to finally meet Will Jevin and talk to him. It's interesting. <laughs> I, my, to my, my pleasure, my pleasure. And folks, uh, we'll have uh, whatever Don, whatever you send me. I'll in, in terms of audio clips, I'll put those right at the end of the interview here, so you can listen to what Don's recorded. Well, thanks, Will. It's been a pleasure, and uh, and uh, continue on, and uh, I'll be uh, listening. And Don, stay in touch, my friend, and I'll help you any way I can. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, any help is needed. Uh, like I said, I'm old, but I'm still a learning. It's still a learning man's game. Absolutely. And uh, to me, the learning curve is uh, very, it's going to come uh, to decades. I, I know only 
not even a fraction of that. So I, I've been doing this 45 years, and I'm still learning too. Yeah, it brings up more questions than you realize, doesn't it, Will? It sure does. <laughs> the more you learn, the more you ask. So, Well, right. uh, thank you, Will, and uh, see you later. Good talking, my friend. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open now.